Okay, so lesson number one, elders, deacons, preachers, saints, that's the title of the series. And um, this is lesson one. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, um, we'll be reading out of Ephesians chapter four in a, in a little while, so you might open to there. That'll be, our, that'll be the text that we're uh, looking at today. Uh, I want to start with uh, just a statement about uh, the idea of elders and deacons, preachers, saints, and that is that uh, in order to reach its full potential, each congregation of the Lord's Church needs to cultivate and to have good leadership. So this series is not just about these uh, roles in the church, but actually how these roles uh, contribute to overall good uh, leadership, in the church and also contribute to uh, church growth. Uh, there's, there's no um, group or organization, you know, whether it be business or military or church, that can rise above its leadership. So this course is really about, about leadership. Uh, Jesus himself said, um, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. So it's interesting to note what Jesus says about leadership uh, just in this one verse. Uh, two things, two simple things. One, he says, in, in context, of course, he's referring to himself as the teacher and master that we're to strive to be like. So in context, that's what he's talking about. But in principle, he's saying that in the church, we're not in competition with our leaders, we're striving to be like our leaders. Important idea, and an idea like a thread, an idea thread that's going to run all the way through this uh, series. So in this way, the, the growth and the quality of each congregation can be measured by the growth and the quality of its leaders. This is why church growth is tied to leadership. So if someone says, well, what do we do? You know, uh, we, you know, we want our church to grow. Um, how do we do that? Well, we start focusing on leadership and cultivating leadership at every level. That's the first thing to do uh, when we want to cultivate uh, church growth. Uh, because when leaders grow, uh, the church grows. Uh, so if you want the church to grow, you must first help the leaders to grow. Uh, seeing the leaders you know, pursuing growth is one of the factors that stimulates growth among the followers and the disciples. You know? And that's in any endeavor, isn't it? You look and you say, well, if they can do it, I can do it. If he can do it, I can do it. If she is stepping out and doing this, well, I can do that too. That's just human nature. And that principle works in the church as well. So you know, I, I believe that uh, most of us want this congregation to continue growing so we can Obviously, we want to honor God and we want to confess Christ. We, we want to build up the kingdom by, by winning souls. I, I've never heard anybody not want those type of things for the church. So this series of lessons about elders and deacons and preachers and saints will describe the work and the responsibilities for each of these roles in the Lord's body. And hopefully this will help those already serving to become more fruitful in their service and motivate others to strive to new levels of commitment and leadership uh, in the church. Okay, so let's, uh, let's read that passage I was talking to you about in Ephesians. That's where we begin. Uh, this passage mentions uh, every specific role in the church except that of deacon. So Paul says, he who descended is himself also he who ascended above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So verse 10 begins by referring to the divinity and therefore the authority of Christ. That's where everything always begins. Why do we do what we do? Well, we're Christians. Why are we Christians? Because we believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God, He's divine. So that always is the basis for all the instruction. So Paul you know, is establishing the basis for what he's saying. You know, Jesus is divine. 
Therefore, he has the authority and the ability to do the things that Paul is going to talk about. He descended from heaven to earth. Well, the incarnation, God made man. He ascended, he says, after his death and resurrection, he ascended to heaven. And then what he did to fulfill all is contained in the following verses. In other words, the one who came from heaven and went back to heaven, he's the divine one. And as the divine one has the authority to do what he said he did. And what did he do? Well, in verse 11 it says, he gave. In other words, that word gave, not just like, hey, give, you know, pass me the salt. You know, that's not the idea of this verb here. This verb says, uh, means to set into place, like a puzzle. You know, you're having a puzzle, you take a piece, you set it into place. And so he set into place. Well, what did he set into place? Well, this verb uh, you know, refers to verse eight, verse eight. He gave gifts. Jesus sets into place or gives to the church certain gifts by virtue of his divinity, proven by the fact that he resurrected from the dead and ascended to heaven. You see, they're all this whole idea is strung together. And so what are these gifts that he gave? Well, the gifts are the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and teachers that Jesus gives or sets into place in the church along with the grace to carry out their ministries. That's what Jesus has done. Now, I want you to notice that in the uh, verse, he says that he gave to some, he gave to some, all right? He who descended is himself, also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things, and he gave to some, not everybody, not everybody in the church has these ministries, just some. Also, each has a different ministry according to the grace given by the Lord, but all of them serve the one purpose. And then in verse 12, he describes what that purpose is. They all serve the one purpose of equipping the saints with skills that will enable them to build up the body of Christ which is the church. It's a beautiful, compact description of how and what Jesus has done to form leadership and to enable the growth of the body of Christ. So that's the setup. That's the, the launching pad for our uh, series on elders, deacons, preachers, and saints. So what are the things that he gave and how do they, how do they function? Well, here are some of the roles mentioned and information about each. Now, what I'm doing here in this first lesson, I'm giving a survey of everything I'm going to do. And then you know, in the following weeks, we're going to drill down and go into this uh, with a little more um, uh, in-depth uh, information. So one of the roles mentioned here are apostles, means messengers, one who is sent. Not just, hey, go to the store and pick up a quart of milk, one who is sent but like a legate or an, or an ambassador. You know? uh, those are the apostles. They are sent. All right? They are sent. They were the original witnesses of the baptism and the ministry, the death, the resurrection, ascension of Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 22. Peter talks about the qualifications of those who would serve as apostles. Their original ministry was to testify to the resurrection of Jesus and confirm their witness with signs and miracles. We read about that in chapter three, verses 14 and 15. So those, that's one role that he describes. He also talks about prophets. Prophets, well, we know what prophets do. They foretell, they talk about future events. Uh, in the New Testament, we read about Agabus who uh, foretells or prophesies as concerning an event in the future, a famine that would uh, overtake the countryside. Uh, they also speak God's word. Their original ministry was to serve as, I, I get for, for, for the sake of a better term, they were living Bibles, if you wish, uh, in the early church. Obviously, all the words of Jesus had not yet been recorded uh, by the apostles and others, and so the early church counted many times on prophets who would speak God's word accurately in order to guide the church. So 
with the completion of course and the distribution of the apostles witness and teaching preserved in the written form later on these two ministries the ministry of apostleship you know the witness of the resurrection the ministry of prophecy uh, was replaced uh, by the uh, scriptures themselves. It's not that the ministry of apostleship, meaning the ministry of witnessing the resurrection of Christ, it's not that that ministry stopped. It's not that the ministry of speaking God's word stopped. It's just that the way that this is done and after the, uh, after the, uh, the, the scriptures were uh, collected and preserved, it's just that the way that these two ministries were done uh, changed. Uh, the written word took over the task of being the witness of the resurrection of Christ. The written word took over the task of the prophets in speaking God's word uh, accurately. Then he talks about um, uh, evangelists, some, some say preacher. Uh, the word evangelist means to proclaim. The preacher's role is to announce or make public as the word suggests, God's word. Uh, another task of the preacher is to establish and organize the church. Titus chapter one, verse five talks about that. So this is the natural outgrowth of what follows the proclamation of the word. The word produces the church. People come, they're baptized, they're, they're, they're brought into the body of Christ uh, by the word, and then those people are taught and matured and organized for service uh, by the ministers beginning with the uh, preachers. And of course, this ministry continues today. Only the methods have changed, right? Modern communication systems and a change in social and cultural habits, you know, see the modern evangelist proclaiming in a variety of ways, uh, using obviously uh, the pulpit, but also so many other ways, newspapers, radio, television, internet, so on and so forth. Same ministry, proclaiming the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, same ministry, except we have so many more tools today to get the word out to so many more people in so many uh, different, uh, different places. The message never changes, the messengers are always called and trained in the same way, but the way we get the message out has changed. And for those of you who've come in a little bit later, I'm just saying we're going over these roles here very quickly today as a kind of a survey, and then we're going to go into more depth as the weeks go on. Then, he, um, uh, then Paul mentions apostles, prophets, evangelists. Then he talks about um, uh, pastors and teachers. And I want to read a, a, a passage from Acts chapter 20 that Paul is writing, or Luke is writing about what is taking place. It says, from Miletus, uh, he, sent, he there is Paul, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. Uh, and then in verse 28 of chapter 20, Luke records what Paul is saying to the elders. And I'm reading this to make a point here, so bear with me. He says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, I want you to notice that uh, pastors and teachers here, not two separate categories, but only one. Uh, pastor, elder, bishop, all of these terms describe the very same person, and this person does his work by teaching. As a matter of fact, in the passage that we just read, all the words refer to the same person. A pastor uh, is, is a shepherd, simply the word for shepherd, uh, describes the manner in which uh, the pastor or the elder or the leader does his work. Uh, the term bishop, sometimes used, uh, we use the word overseer, um, uh, uh, describes the responsibility or the authority that this individual has. Um, sometimes the word elder is used and that refers to the age or the maturity of that individual. But all the words in that passage all refer to the same person. I'll give you an example. Uh, I, Michael, uh, I am a son of Tony and uh, Yolande or Jane. You know, I'm a son. Uh, I am a husband uh, to Lise. I am a father to uh, Emily and Paul and Julia and William. Uh, I am a grandfather. Too many names there to go into. 
You know what I'm saying? I, I am a brother in Christ. Okay? I'm an uncle. All these different terms, they all refer to me. In the very same way, elder, pastor, bishop, overseer, presbyter, all these words that the Bible uses are simply describing the same person in a variety of ways, usually talking about his maturity level or his responsibility or his task or how he does his work and so on and so forth. So in Acts chapter 20, you could say that pastors are elders who oversee the church. Or you could say that elders are overseers who pastor the church. All the words are you know, like Legos, they're all mix and match, but they're always talking about the same person. And, and we'll go into that in more, in more depth as we go along through our series. So this particular ministry saw people providing wise and experienced leadership to the church through accurate teaching and holy living. You see, you can be a teacher without being an elder, but you cannot be an elder without being a teacher. We have a lot of people in the church who teach, teach Sunday school classes, teach the ladies, teach the kids, teach the teens, whatever. You know, there's a lot of people who exercise the gift of being able to teach, but not all those teachers are elders. Conversely, we also have elders in the church, but all of our elders are teachers. Okay? So that role also exists today and is exercised within the context of our modern age. However, no social or technological change nullifies the need for, of course, wise and spiritual leadership. All right, the other role not mentioned in this particular passage is the one, uh, but mentioned elsewhere, 1 Timothy, for example, chapter three, or deacons. The word deacon literally means a servant or a slave and was used in connection with Jesus. Use that term for Jesus himself. Anybody who thinks, oh, deacons, you know, they're at the bottom of the list, you know, uh, doesn't understand that the, the term deacon was applied to Jesus in Romans chapter 15, 8. Applied to apostles, 1 Corinthians 3, 5, as well as certain people in the church who rendered spiritual or special service to the body. Uh, we read about them. Uh, offering uh, benevolence work, maintenance work, so on and so forth. And that rule also exists in the church today. So today I've just mentioned these roles very briefly and in the weeks to come we're going to kind of go in depth and uh, take a look at each one of these to be able to understand you know, the needs, the type of work they do, qualifications, all kinds of things, give a lot of background information to these things. All right. Now, as I said, next time we're going to talk about these separately, but today I want to answer the question, what's the difference between an elder or a preacher and a member? It's always a question that comes up when we discuss these things. All right? What's the difference, they say? What's the difference between an elder and a member? You know, what's the difference between a deacon and a, and, and, and a saint? Because I hear a lot of people say, I don't need to be a deacon, I can just do this thing. Who needs deacons? Who needs elders? You know? And there are, there are even some churches that do away with these roles because they say, oh, we're all the same. No, there's no difference. But there is a difference. There is a difference. Um, in Mark uh, chapter uh, 10, verses 42 uh, to 45, I want to just read a passage here. It says, this is Jesus. It says, calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now the reason I read that passage in connection with the question, what's the difference, is this. The difference is not power. The difference between the roles is not one of power. You know, a lot of churches follow the organizational charts of human organizations and they assign power to various levels of church hierarchy. But the New Testament church is a body and the hand, as it says, is not more important than the foot, 
and each member has a place to serve, and all are directed by the head which is in Christ. Now Ephesians chapter four that we read at the beginning says that God gave certain people certain gifts and roles to fill in order to help the body serve itself and grow until it reaches a maturity level equal to the Lord, which is Christ. You know, this, I have this funny image in my mind, an adult head on a baby's body, like, it's kind of weird, isn't it, if you had an adult head on a baby's body? But in a way, that's what Paul is saying here. You've got the adult head, Christ, but on a baby's body, the church. And he said, Christ has given different roles and gifts and grace to different people to enable them to equip the body so that the body can grow up to match the head. So you have an adult head with an adult body, a mature head with a mature body. Now, there is a difference between the roles, and there's a difference between a deacon and a saint, and an elder and a deacon, and so on and so forth. There is a difference because if, if it were not so, the Holy Spirit would not have specified a variety of roles in the church. If it were not so, then everyone would be a saint and there would be no distinctions whatsoever. But there are distinctions, why? Because God has made distinctions. So there are differences that we can determine. The question is, what are they? Well, one of the differences has to do with responsibility. The different roles do not represent power, they represent levels of responsibility. For example, all are called to serve, but some have the task of mobilizing and organizing and directing that service, as well as serving in a special capacity. For example, in Acts chapter 6, verse 3, we read about the apostles who had um, the church select qualified men who could be put in charge of a task of feeding the poor. These deacons, if you wish, were given a special responsibility. So what's the difference? Well, one difference is task. Task. Special tasks, particular tasks, have been given to particular people. Um, all are called to share their faith in their a normal course of their lives, but some have the unique task of proclaiming the gospel as the central point of their lives. Everybody in this room you know, has the responsibility of sharing their faith when the opportunity arises, okay? But my life has been devoted to only that one thing. I don't go to work to, as an accountant or teacher or a mechanic or whatever, you know? No, my, my whole task is to figure out ways to proclaim the gospel to more and more people uh, as I can. So I have a different task. I use myself as, as an example there. So all Christians must be evangelistic, but only some Christians become evangelists. See the difference? The same is true for pastors and, and, and teachers that we must all teach and encourage one another, right? Paul says encourage one another and build up one another in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11. We're all responsible for doing that, building up one another, encouraging one another. However, the older, more experienced, more enlightened Christian men, uh, to them goes the responsibility of leadership and this is done not by power but by teaching and by example. The Bible specifically says and warns the leaders you know, uh, not to lord over the flock. And so we see that one difference between the various roles within the church is the degree of responsibility attached to each one's. Deacons um, uh, direct tasks. Uh, evangelists spread the gospel and organize. Elders direct the body and nurture the body. So that's one difference, task. Another difference um, is one of aptitude. Different people have different gifts from God or a combination of gifts. We read in Romans chapter 12 verses four uh, to eight, it says, 
For just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or he who teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So here in Romans 12, Paul demonstrates the different roles are marked by different gifts given to each. You know, one who has no ability to teach cannot lead because this is the, the main tool of leadership. Uh, one who is poor does not have the means to, st to sustain the church financially. He, can be he or she can be generous in their own right, but uh, cannot, quote, practice liberality in the sense that they're like major supporters of good works and so on and so forth, it's not their gift. One no organizational or administrational ability will not be responsible for the bookkeeping, although he may be well suited for the other types of ministry. You know, I mean, this is common sense. In Timothy and Titus, in those epistles, there are passages which describe the qualities possessed by pastors and evangelists and deacons. And I think these, guide, these are guides to help and direct us into our roles and help us discover our gifts. You know, as you read these, you're saying to yourself, oh, I can do that, That's, Paul's talking about me. He's describing my abilities. And that's okay to be reading with those kind of glasses. You know, I'm reading the word to, to see what is it saying to me about what, what I can do. There's no boasting there. And we'll be reading those passages, providing us with a lot of information concerning elders, evangelists, and their role. Everyone is a saint. You know, when I was growing up, uh, I, most of you know, I grew up in the Catholic Church. If you come from Quebec in the 50s, you know, everybody was Catholic. If you're Italian <laughs> growing up in Quebec, you're 100% sure that you're going to be growing up in the Catholic Church. And I was an altar boy and I was, you know, I did all those, uh, I did all those things. And as a boy, I used to go to St. Joseph's Oratory, this humongous, basilica on the, on the mountain in, in the middle of Montreal that you can see from 25 miles away. And I would go there as a boy and visit and, so, and see all the saints, you know, the statues of Saint Joseph and all the other saints, Saint Andre. And, you know. and these were the saints. These individuals were paraded before us as the saints. You know, and only a few throughout history. And it would take years and years before a saint could be made, you know, before the Pope would declare such and such a woman or such and such a man a saint. I remember one of my aunts was very upset when Saint Philophena was bumped from the calendar. You know, every day is a saint's day you know, and Saint Philomena was her saint. You know, she was the saint that, that my aunt would pray to all the time and she would buy the calendar every year you know, with all the saints. You know, she, I forget when it was, March or something. She'd look and say, oh, there's my saint. You know? Well, there's only 365 days, right? Well, over the passage of many, many centuries, a lot more than 365 people were nominated saints, so they had to bump somebody. So one day they bumped her. They bumped Philomena off the calendar and they put in a, a more modern saint. And boy, my aunt was so upset with that. that you know, well, uh, that's that system where they elevate one individual to, quote, sainthood. But we understand uh, from the scriptures that those who are baptized into Christ become saints. We're the saints. Every single individual in the church is a saint. Everyone is a member. Everyone is a servant. But certain ones have particular gifts which give them a particular responsibility within the body. Now, the third difference, remember we said, so what's the difference? Responsibility, aptitude, and then the third one is that elders, evangelists, deacons, they are appointed to their tasks. For example, in Acts chapter six, the special servants, they were chosen for their task based on their qualification. It wasn't just volunteerism. 
In Acts chapter six, it doesn't say that you know, six, seven men volunteered to do the work. They, they were selected to do the work. In Acts 13 verse three, in 1 Timothy four and 14, evangelists, preachers, were separated and they were commended to their task. They didn't just appoint themselves. In Acts 14, 23, in Titus 1 and 5, we see that elders are chosen. Now the method that they're chosen depends on the circumstances, but nobody in the church says, you know what, I believe today I'm ready to be an elder and I'm appointing myself an elder and I'm going to declare myself an elder or I'm going to declare that I'm in the running to become an elder. It's not politics here. Although sometimes politics enters into it, it shouldn't, but sometimes it does. The point I'm trying to make here is that these roles are all appointed roles. People are not elected to their positions based on their popularity. They don't just volunteer to be elders. These roles are chosen from among the brethren to be responsible for certain tasks of evangelism and service, leadership, because of clearly demonstrated qualifications. If there's no appointing, there's no anointing. If you want to be anointed, you have to be appointed. So a church, and I'm going to kind of double back to my original idea here at the very beginning, first statement. A church cannot grow unless it has good leadership. And you cannot have good leadership unless you have biblical leadership. So the next couple of Sundays, we're going to see uh, us explore biblical leadership as it is exercised in the roles of elders and deacons and preachers and saints. There's a sense of uh, leadership also that each one of us is responsible for. And I will try to outline the work and the qualifications and how these things all work together. I'm also going to discuss the special role of wives of these men and spend some time in discussing the response of the church as well as our role as saints in the body of Christ. In other words, how do the saints respond to deacons? How do the saints respond to those who serve as elders? How do the saints respond to the preachers and teachers and so on and so forth? What's our role in, in all of this? In the end, I hope that our leaders will be renewed and have a, a clear vision of their responsibility, certainly. But I also hope that these lessons will plant the desire to lead in the hearts of the many who need to take on you know, more responsibility but haven't yet stepped forward. Okay, so that's our first uh, class uh, in the series.